Sorry, everyone. It's taken a little while for me to get into the YouTube for some reason this morning, but we're almost there. Good morning, everyone. It is May 28th, 2024. It is 8.02 a.m. My name is Deanna Diamore, Director of Health for the City of Norwalk. I'm going to call the Board of Health meeting to order. Uh, present, we have board members Frank Ehrlich, Ken Laleem, Norman Weinberger, and Joan McNeil. We also have staff members Aniela Fignon, Megan Fogno, and Brian Weeks present. Good morning, everyone. Um, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the April 30th, 2024 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? Norman approves. Do I have a sec second motion? I'll, I'll second that. Joan seconds. Um, any discussion on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. All right, minutes passed. Thank you, everyone. Next, we have an update on our quality improvement plan. Um, and I just want to say that our quality improvement work group has been working really hard on um, really getting uh, looking at our past quality improvement plan, looking at proposed edits that Aniela has been working on. And um, Aniela has been doing a really great job leading that effort. And so she's going to tell you all about our quality improvement plan and our most recent initiatives. So take it away, Aniela. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Deanna, for hyping me up for this. Um, I'm really excited to share with everybody um, the changes that we have made to our plan. So I'm just gonna go into slideshow mode really quickly. Bam, we're in, all right. So um, we worked um, with the Quality Improvement Work Group, which is a group of nine folks and our performance management team, which is our senior management team and all of our supervisors, um, to really dive deep into our QI plan um, and revise it for the next couple of years so that we have um, a trajectory for us to follow, some goals set for us um, to stay in line with uh, standards set out by the Public Health Accreditation Board, FAB, um, which is our accrediting agency. Um, and excited to share all of those changes with you because our QI group um, really did kind of refresh, revamp in January of 2023. And this was a year long process to kind of get all of this together. So here we go. A uh, quick overview, we're just going to do a little overview of what QI actually is. Um, talk about our culture of quality improvement. <laughs> Uh, what a QI plan is, and talk about some of the actual specific updates to our QI plan here at the Norwalk Health Department. So as a reminder to anybody who is not familiar with QI, QI is uh, the use of a deliberate and defined improvement process in public health, which is focused on activities that are responsive to community needs and improving population health. It refers to a continuous and ongoing effort to achieve measurable improvements in the efficiency, effectiveness, performance, accountability, outcomes, and other indicators of quality in services or processes that achieve equity and improve the health of the community. Having our culture of quality improvement at a health department um, is really one of the key items of being a, a nationally accredited organization. Um, so the idea is that we don't want quality improvement to be this kind of static thing where, you know, the work group gets into the room, has a work group meeting, they talk about QI, and then that's the end of the QI stuff and, until they meet again. We really want this to, um, you know, kind of bleed through the organization and have it be something that, that, that really permeates through all of our divisions um, and is shared and held by all of our staff members. So uh, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, NHO, as you are probably familiar with, uh, put together a roadmap to a culture of quality improvement um, where they upheld six foundational elements, which you can see on the screen, leadership commitment, QI infrastructure, employee empowerment, customer focus, teamwork and collaboration, and continuous quality improvement. 
and used these criteria to kind of understand um, or help health departments understand where they might actually be on this road to quality uh, improvement and having that culture be, um, you know, really fully entrenched in the organization. And so as you can see on the little roadmap to the right, um, phase one um, is really just, you know, a health department doesn't have a knowledge of quality improvement. They're not practicing it. Um, it's really just not ingrained at all. Whereas phase six, um, everybody is practicing a QI culture, which means in their day-to-day -day lives, they're thinking about opportunities for quality improvement in their roles, uh, in their divisions in the department in general, um, and really able to see how QI uh, affects every part of their day. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what a quality improvement plan is before diving into some of the specifics from our plan. Um, it is a basic guidance document that describes how a health department will manage, deploy, and review quality. It also serves to inform staff and stakeholders of the direction, timeline, activities, and importance of quality and quality improvement. And I pulled this from the Minnesota Department of Health, and I just want to put a little plug in there. If you guys are ever looking for great resources, they've got some good ones. So what does our QI plan look like? The purpose of our plan is to subscribe uh, the health department's current and desired future quality improvement infrastructure and to support the identification of the most relevant and valuable quality improvement activities. And so our policy is to have an interest in improving the quality of programs, processes, and services to achieve a high level of efficiency, effectiveness, and customer satisfaction. And our commitment is really enshrined in our vision, um, which we came up with during our most recent strategic plan, Healthy Norwalkers Thriving in Our Vibrant Community. Um, and you can see it, again, kind of enshrined in two of our value statements, which are we value quality and consistency by incorporating public health standards and best practices into our operations and maintaining our status as a nationally accredited health department. And we value high levels of customer satisfaction and community trust. When you take a look at the structure of our particular QI plan, uh, these are all of the components and you can follow it from left to right. Um, so it starts with an overview of quality at the Norwalk Health Department, including um, a QI roadmap culture assessment of our specific health department, which we'll, we'll look at in just a moment. Um, the organizational structure of our uh, QI in infrastructure. Um, so, you know, how do we split up the roles and responsibilities? Um, what does our work group look like? How often do we meet? All that kind of stuff. Uh, we talk about training and how health department staff are trained, um, you know, whether that is incoming new staff who have no um, understanding of what QI is, or if it's a work group member who is looking for a little additional or um, a little hardier information or understanding of QI. Then we go into how we actually do QI projects. So we talk about our project selection, we talk about goals and objectives for the actual work group team. Um, we talk about monitoring and evaluation. So how we actually make sure that the plan is, you know, being followed, um, you know, what are the sort of the metrics that we can use to make sure that our goals are being met. And finally, we do have a communication section, which, um, you know, just discusses quickly who the plan is intended to be shared with. So a couple of the uh, major updates to the QI plan in this iteration were some logistical updates. Um, you know, we revised some of the things that uh, needed to get technically changed, like our, our new vision, our value statements that many of them got tweaked during our last strategic plan session. Um, added some additional uh, QI history about the health department, specifically between 2018 and 2024 to explain a pause in QI activities that were due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also fleshed out a lot more of the history to make sure that it was really clear who had done what over the course of time. Didn't want to make it confusing because we've had so many uh, changeover or uh, turnover in positions. And so wanted to make it clear who had taken what kind of trainings um, so that we have a better understanding of who needs what uh, going forward. And then, of course, um, there was the assessment of our health department's QI culture. So that's really what I, I want to dive into right now, um, because, again, the other stuff was really logistical, just kind of swapping out some information and, and adding in some um, some history. Um, but 
talking about a QI um, or a culture of QI, what, what you kind of notice through the levels, obviously, is that um, with each level, there is more and more of an understanding and an application of quality improvement throughout the health department. So as I mentioned, as we were looking at that little NATO roadmap, um, level one means that there's really no knowledge of QI, whereas you know, level two means that we're not involved with QI activities. Level three means that there's information or ad hoc QI activities, um, so nothing really formal. Level four means that formal QI activities have been implemented in specific areas and there is ad hoc training. So, you know, it's not a consistent uh, standardized protocol for training. Level five is a formal division-wide uh, QI activities and trainings are implemented on a, a regular basis. And then level six is the ideal, right? This is like the pinnacle of where we want to get. It is where we have a QI culture, all division levels incorporate performance management and quality improvement principles into um, their daily practice and their work. So when we took um, a look at um, our staff and our work over the last couple of years, what we did um, was to do uh, an assessment first with some QI leadership. So that included myself, Deanna, and uh, Megan, who was our former uh, QI work group facilitator. And so we did a sort of a quick scan um, and went through each of the different elements, looked at the definition of the elements and the components and tried to understand or, you know, kind of put a, put a uh, plot a point um, to say where exactly we were on the roadmap. We repeated this exercise with the quality improvement work group, and we really used um, their answers and their responses to drive the actual um, end results. You know, we used the leadership results to help sway our, um, our roadmap phase one way or another if the work group team was not sure if they really should land in four or five. As you can see, there are a couple of areas where we decided we were somewhat in the middle. Um, and what really came out of this is um, a picture of a, a little bit of a backslide during uh, COVID-19. You know, we paused a lot of those formal activities. And so that uh, enshrinement of QI throughout our divisions and all of our new staff, especially with all the turnover and new hires that we had during that time, um, you know, that wasn't at the forefront of our uh of our priorities. We were really de dealing with a crisis. And now our work is going to be to kind of move us forward on the roadmap away from phases four, um, you know, can pass phase five and really ideally towards phase six where everybody is ingrained in um, regular use of quality improvement in their day-to-day uh, -day work. The other updates to our QI plan um, included language updates to accurately reflect roles and responsibilities of QI involved staff. Um, so that specifically is the project coordinator, myself, uh, the director of health, obviously that's Deanna, our work group, um, our, our quality improvement work group, um, which is a group of nine folks. As I said, they are folks from across our department. So different divisions, um, you know, different um, kind of roles. We've got frontline staff, supervisors. It's really a really a nice mix. Um, we also talked about um, how QI work group members are selected and included that process into the plan. Updated the history of QI training and development at the health department. So not only explaining the history, you know, like what we've actually done, but um, really did a deep dive into specific training so that we understand who needs what at this point. And then we created new and revised supporting documents, including a work group charter, a formal membership list, a work plan, and a storyboard template, which I'm kind of going to now. So the first thing um, that I wanted to just kind of, you know, show you guys is our quality improvement work group charter. And this evolved out of a series of conversations about how do we ensure that staff members who come from different divisions, who have different priorities, um, and may have different ways of engaging in meetings are all on the same page and all feel respected, heard, and valued during our conversations. So we created a list of rules of engagement. Um, and really, I'm going to say that we didn't create this list ourselves. We really pulled this from um, Deanna's strategic planning session back in 2022. 
Um, but we did review each and every element of the rules of engagement and the quality improvement work group signed off and on each and every one of them. And uh, this is how we operate during our meetings. You know, we really try to stay polite. We try to start and end on time. We really just want to hold everybody, um, you know, with the greatest respect and uh, ensure that everybody has a chance to participate and share their views. After all, quality improvement is not about one person. It's really about a group of people coming together, sharing all of the information and, and digging deep to find root causes and, and solutions that work for everyone. Our second uh, new document is our Appendix C, um, which is really just a, a work group member list. So in the future, we do kind of plan to roll this up into a larger charter with, um, you know, not just rules, but also sort of an explanation of how the quality improvement work group um, you know, operates. But for now, what we have is a list of members, and I'm really happy to show um, that we have members from almost all of our different divisions. Um, so as you can see, we have clinical folks, we have a health inspector from our environmental health division, we have Megan and Kelly from our community health division, um, and uh, we've got Catalina and myself um, from our office of the director. So the QI work plan. Um, as um, most work plans kind of go, what we did to set this up was to create several goals. Um, and we wanted to keep this relatively simple because our work our, our work group only meets uh, four times a year while there are intermittent meetings in between and there are projects that are being, um, you know, overseen. We do want to make sure that the goals are realistic. So we have three goals. The first being that uh, staff members receive on and training quality improvement. The second goal being that we implement quality improvement into organizational practice programs, processes, and interventions. And the third being that we continue to foster an agency culture of quality. We had a number of um, objectives, as you can see, like 1.1, 2.1, 2.2, all that kind of stuff um, that really is going to hold us to making sure we meet all of our objectives. So really what we want to ensure is that we're providing uh, a relevant and applicable training for everybody, that we are uh, implementing quality improvement projects that are aligned with the Public Health Accreditation Board standards, and that we are continuing to foster that agency culture of quality, like I mentioned, um, you know, by having QI work groups, engaging staff, not just our QI team um, in, in projects and activities, communicating results of our QI projects. Um, and really just continuing to assess where we are. The things that we track in our work plan besides the goals and objectives are the activities or the strategies that we are going to use to meet each of the goals. We outline the responsibility. So, you know, what staff member or staff members are really the person leading the charge there. We put in a tentative timeline, very flexible on that. Our work plan is a working work plan. And we also put in measures to um, identify how we've actually met our goals. The last piece um, that we, or last document that we created to uh, supplement our QI plan is our storyboard template. So this is something that um, uh, has been used in the past. Uh, Megan Fagno actually shared this with me and um, we just kind of spruced it up a little bit with the updated Norwalk logo or co-branded logo um, and providing a little bit of information about what you would actually uh, include in each of these areas. Um, so what we did is to use the PDSA or Plan, Do, Study, Act model in here. There are other tools that may be used. And so sometimes this might not actually be the best um, template to use, but it is the easiest template and it is um, something that we will be able to use for most of our projects. So we're really excited for this because this means that we're going to be able to share um, really all of our project outcomes with you know whoever we want to. We can post this around the department. We can share it with you as the Board of Health. We can post it online, uh, really anything we want. And that is the, the summary of all of our QI updates here. Um, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Oh, I think uh, Frank has a question, Aniela. It, not just a question, a, a, a comment. I think your presentation was excellent. And I think what you 
what your group has decided as a future course is fantastic. Uh, having been part of hospital QI and uh, PM for a long time, uh, I think you've really covered the bases. My one uh, comment or suggestion is not just for you, it's for all of us. And that is, I think we need to plan ahead so that there is no more COVID-19 pauses. I think putting healthcare in the kind of a basket that we have to have a pause to deal with a major epidemic like COVID is not the way we should look at the future. I think we should figure out what we would do if another COVID epidemic occurred so that we could maintain the vital parts of our healthcare duties and responsibilities. One of the flaws in the hospital pictures was that they weren't prepared mm -hmm. with how to deal with a major epidemic. So everything else faltered. Well, I don't think the Board of Health should follow suit. I think the Board of Health should figure out how they're going to maintain the vital areas so that there is never again a COVID-19 pause. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Joan? Anella, that was an excellent presentation. You, uh, you, it was complete. You covered uh, all the aspects. Um, very, ex very, very good. Um, my question for you is: um, how, how do you plan to operate um, to put this into operation for the the wider health department? Is it um, is it something that you roll out to the health department to the um, to the people that are not on the work group? Yes. So the QI plan is shared with all health department members. In fact, now mm -hmm. that we've shared it with the Board of Health, um, we would like to share it with the rest of um, our our staff at the board meet or at the next uh, all staff meeting. Um, mm -hmm. We've already, you know, shared it with many staff members because, uh, you know, although our QI work group is the one that kind of put it together, we got suggestions from a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, we definitely share this with everybody. And then when new employees are onboarded, one of the first um, items that they need to complete Actually, maybe not one of the first. We kind of put it a little bit later down the line because quality mm -hmm. improvement is a lot to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the items that they need to complete as part of their orientation is a basic introduction to quality improvement. They do that with mm -hmm. me. They go through a training mm -hmm. and they are introduced to the plan and sent the plan uh, after their orientation so that everyone is familiar with it. Yeah, I, I love the plan, do, study, act model. It's um, it's very effective. All right, thank you. It is, and very easy to teach. You know, yeah, we can, exactly. you can get it across in one basic training. Yeah, so yeah. Um, we're, we're big fans over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Good job. Thanks, Thanks Joan. Yeah. Thanks, Daniela. And I just, um, I would like to reflect a little bit on what Frank, um, his suggestions, his comments, because I agree with him, you know, it's something we've been working on and, and we're, we're still not there yet, right? Like, so we've been through the pandemic, we've been able to add Ryan's position to the city operating budget. You know, now we have a program director of epidemiology, of epidemiology and informatics. You know, we never had an epidemiologist before COVID and thanks to the mayor's support, thanks to the board of health support, thanks to Lamont's support, you know, we're able to have that position, the BET support. Um, we've also been able to utilize grant funding to enhance our clinical staff, but you know, I do have concerns about some of this grant funding that we've got through COVID, you know, what happens when it goes away. And so I think it would be great if we all could get together and sort of, you know, I've been doing a lot of that already and thinking it through in my head, but um, getting the board involved and, you know, what's the plan moving forward and how do we advocate and figure out, you know, how we continue to maintain that strong infrastructure that we're able to put in place, you know, because we had um, the staffing and with Brian and his division, um, the contact tracing support, you know, when MPAX comes around, came around, we're able to quickly mobilize and, and respond. You know, we added to our community health staff as well um, through the pandemic. So um, thank you for saying that. Thanks for that suggestion and still a work in progress, but more work to do.
Um, anything else related to quality improvement? Thank you, Aniela, great presentation. The next item on the agenda is our, oh, Aniela is still on the agenda. <laughs> We've got the FAB annual report. Um, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but I'll pass it on to her to give her uh, the update about, about our report. <laughs> Thank you, Deanna. Um, so I'm very excited to uh, announce that our FAB, our Public Health Accreditation Board annual report was uh, accepted with, you know, glowing, uh, you know, acceptances, which just means basically that they said, yes, good to go. <laughs> um so this is a, an annual report that we submit to the accreditation board um, every March. It's based on our time of year of accreditation back in March of 2022. So at the end of March every year, we are um, you know, supposed to submit some sort of documentation that kind of proves that we are continuing to align ourselves and do work that um, you know, is in line with our standards and measures that are promulgated by the FAB um, organization. So this year, um, we were able to pull together some really great uh, narratives and documentation for the annual report. And I just wanted to go over really quickly, um, you know, some of the, the stars, um, our superstars who contributed to this. Um, starting with Brian, um, Brian Weeks, you know, he, um, submitted and wrote up um, a reflection report um, on our foundational capabilities related to uh, surveillance and assessment. And so what that really means is he put together a narrative for the accreditation board describing how he and his epidemiology and informatics division have really worked to build this out over the last year or so. Um, what are the, you know, components that um, have created it into a division? How has that public health capacity been met? Um, and what are we doing to continue to, to work towards that? So um, that was one of the things that Brian worked on. He also worked on uh, putting together public or population health outcomes, um, which is a series of 10 metrics that we track from year to year. Um, sometimes we have to change those metrics based on the data that's available to us. And so Brian did a great job of parsing through all the data available to us, choosing sort of the best metrics to report on to FAB. Um, we want to try to keep things that are consistent from year to year. So um, he did a really good job, again, of trying to find data that we are going to be able to report on from year to year and hopefully show some um, improvement in population health outcomes. One of the things that we also have to do when reporting on population health outcomes is to select one of the outcomes to develop a narrative on. And so Kelly Tomlinson from our community health division drafted and wrote up uh, a really beautiful narrative on um, the obesity metric that Brian reported on and talked about all of the community health programs that um, we have here at the health department that have contributed to um, working on those health outcomes that are, you know, working to address obesity in the Norwalk community. Um, and so that was submitted and um, it was really exciting to see that collaboration between Brian and Kelly across divisions to see how the, the data really can be supported by the narrative um, of, of everything that we're doing. Also want to give a shout out to uh, Deanna um, for pulling together a narrative, um, a continued advancement narrative that was all about sort of our um, strategic plan monitoring and, um, you know, really where we're headed with um, uh, continuing to revise our our approach to integrating with the rest of uh, the city departments um, to make sure that our that our uh, strategic plan is inclusive of um, you know internal partners that will impact us in a big way and that have a, a huge ability for us to work with and move forward some of the um, goals in our strategic plan. So those were um, most of the elements that were included. There's also, you know, a little couple of Q&A stuff um, in, in which, you know, Deanna and I responded to and just kind of told Fab, you know, nothing major, no crises here at the health department. We're in good shape. Um, and so we submitted all of that information at the end of March and uh, towards the end of April or the beginning of May, I can't remember the date exactly, um, we got a, a report back from um, Fab saying, thank you so much. Your annual report has been accepted and we look forward to your next annual report.
So we are in good shape for the next year and are continuing to uh, make progress towards uh, reaccreditation overall. And that is all that I have to report on the annual report. And any questions, please let me know. Any questions or comments? Right. Great job, Daniela. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who contributed. Um, we were really excited once when we got when we got that email. <laughs> um, next item on the agenda is our epidemiology update. So Brian, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Hey, thanks, Deanna. Um, so I'll just go over really quickly. It's just, you know, because obviously we're in the, the warmer months. Uh so fortunately not too many things to kind of hit home here. Uh, but for the respiratory virus situation, it should be seen on the screen share uh, from the CDC, just the general guidance. So just as a quick reminder for the board uh, in terms of kind of what our situation is and some of that guidance. And so, again, you know, we're at minimal overall respiratory illness activity in the state of Connecticut, which is great. Um, you know, illness trends in general, flu is decreasing, RSV, COVID, no change. But as you'll see, the activity is fairly low. Uh, and again, the guidance from the CDC right now is staying up to date with immunizations. Um, you know, that includes, you know, the flu vaccine, the COVID vaccine, and even the RSV vaccine if somebody's eligible for it. Um, you know, practicing the proper, you know, good hygiene in terms of hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, uh, air purification, getting fresh air, you know, according to events, you know, however you kind of, however somebody deems fit, you know, especially given that, you know, activity is minimal right now. Uh, and but then obviously if somebody does suspect that they're sick or getting sick, you know, staying home and away from others, uh, seeking health care as appropriate, because keep in mind there are antivirals out there for flu and COVID. Uh, and then also just, you know, the other uh, tools that individuals can use based upon the circumstances, such as masks and dis social distancing and things of that nature. So just as a quick refresher, and again, this is guidance from the CDC. Uh, but just to reemphasize that point that activity is minimal, as you can see here, this is the syndromic surveillance for respiratory illness activity. So again, looking at symptoms that are associated with respiratory illness and naturally speaking and looking at a state by state perspective, generally everything's kind of, you know, low or minimal uh, activity and including especially Connecticut, which is, you know, in that lower end of minimal, which is really nice to see uh, in the Northeast in general. Um, you do see like, you know, say for the West Coast right now, you know, it's a little bit higher, <clears throat> higher. It's still at low, but in comparison to everybody else, uh, a little bit higher. Uh, so you can see that as well. Uh, but then again, when you look at emergency department visits, so looking at severity illness, which is kind of more the shift in terms of respiratory illness and, you know, in terms of the monetary metrics, um, you know, nationally, again, activity is very low in terms of, you know, that presentation for ED visits uh, related to respiratory viruses. And then if we zoom into Connecticut, further supporting that picture, uh, and then if we zoom into then Fairfield County, uh, same story, more or less, you know, so flu and COVID are pretty much getting to that almost baseline activity along with RSV that's been there for the last few months. So uh, overall, again, very good news um, in terms of the situation for not only the country, but the state of Connecticut and Fairfield County. Um, so then the other thing probably you've seen in the news and we just want to be mindful of as well as, you know, with COVID especially, you know, it varies at times in terms of the presentation and activity. Uh, and so the news has been covering quite a bit in regards to the flirt variants. Uh, so predominantly, the bigger focus being the KP.2 and KP.3. Uh, so they are a little bit different uh, mutation, subvariant of Omicron. So Omicron, you know, we've been dealing with, with the last couple of years, just different uh, subvariants of it. Uh, and so at the moment, you know, it's almost about uh, there's been a changeover in terms of what we were typically dealing with in the past, you know, for this season with JN1, uh, subvariant here in purple. Uh, it's, you know, progressively shifting over to KP.2 and KP.3. Uh, and so, again, you know, that does create a little bit further uh, drift from, you know, impacting potentially the vaccines, things of that nature. Um, you know, it's nothing that would mitigate the recommendation of receiving the vaccine, especially in preparation for the new season that will be coming up. Uh, the formulation will be better tailored towards these flirt variants, so that'll be great as well. Uh, but just more or less, just keep in mind, whenever we have a subvariant shift over, there is going to potentially be a little bit of an uptick. Uh, that's something that we've always dealt with, uh, you know, with the current expert opinions. Um, you know, it shouldn't be anything too major, but it's something we want to be mindful of. And especially there's a lot of travel going on because, you know, we're pretty much entering almost the summer months and everything. So there's a lot of summer travel and activity. 
So just wanted to make us aware of it. But again, yeah, KP2 is now in the lead, followed by KP3 and then JN17. So those are the top three, you know, sub variants that we're dealing with. Uh, and again, just as a reminder for everybody, kind of following that CDC, you know, that brief guidance, you know, the things that we can do to protect ourselves with respiratory viruses uh, is, again, the immunizations, the hygiene, the steps for cleaning our air and treatment, stay at home and prevent and spread. And again, if that's uh, if that should happen, um, you know, wait until somebody's symptoms are better, you know, and also waiting 24 hours after um, and along with fever free without any sort of fever reducing medications. And then from there, uh, going back to normal activities, but also gauging your situation, uh, but then taking five days of precautions, which also includes like the masking, the distancing, uh, and, you know, just kind of testing just in case sometimes, you know, individuals may rebound relative to their illness. Uh, but then also factoring in what is the current respiratory virus situation in our community, which fortunately, as we saw again, is minimal. Um, and so that's kind of just the major updates in the, the global umbrella of respiratory viruses that we just wanted to remind everybody, because I know it's I don't think we've met in a little while, so I just wanted to kind of refresh everybody's uh, memory there. So more or less, that's it. Um, open to any questions. Uh, Brian? Yes. Is there any um, difference in the uh, data for pediatric patients versus adults? In other words, is Connecticut still at the low end of everything and California, for example, at the higher end? Or is, is there no such data available? So there is a mixture of data out there in terms of the presentation for pediatric versus adult. But I mean, again, keep in mind when I showed you uh, the ED visits for respiratory uh, viruses in general, that's factory in adults and pediatrics. So overall, it's, it's very low. Um, all together. There's also actually, you know, the wastewater monitoring too. Uh, that's another way to kind of keep an eye, especially relative to COVID. It's more robust of a system. And that is showing a little bit of the uptick relative to the West Coast, which we also saw with the, uh, the syndromic. So at least they're further supporting each other. But in terms of age groupings, yeah, there's there's a mixture of data, but it's not a lot. Uh, you know, there's been a scaling back after the emergency of the pandemic uh, in terms of just the real-time or close to real-time information available to monitor that situation. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Frank, for your question. Any other questions? All right. Um, my director's report is next, and I just wanted to highlight an event that is occurring uh, on Thursday evening. So on Thursday, May 30th at 6 p.m. in City Hall in the community room, the city is hosting an enforcement event. It's an enforcement open house. So it's the um, it's going to be an event that the public can attend and hear from those departments that um, are involved in enforcement in the city, such as the Blight Office, Planning and Zoning, uh, Code Enforcement, Police, Fire, and Health. And so, of course, we will be there. Um, we'll be able to highlight some of the work that we do for enforcement. There's also going to be um, some uh, table set up so that people can, after they you know, go over the presentations, if they want to speak directly to, um, to enforcement staff to ask them questions or talk about an issue, um, that'll also be available. So I'll be there um, and we have, you know, Bill will be there who's our Assistant Director of Health for Environmental Health, and we'll have a couple other staff members, um, sanitarian and housing inspector as well, who will be there. So wanted to highlight that it's going to be Thursday evening, May 30th at 6 p.m. So we'll be participating in that event. And I can send um, anybody the more of those details and information for anybody who's interested. Um, it'll be in person, but there also will be a, um, I think, an online, uh, it'll be available online um, for the first part of the, the session. You can send it around, that'd be great. Okay, well, we'll do that. All right, our last, any questions about that? All right, our last item on the agenda is the uh, public participation. And I see we have somebody with their hand raised. Um, Aniela, could you allow uh, Ms. Laura Cella to speak? Ms. Laura Cella, are you able to? I think you're out. You've come off mute. Um, you have three minutes 
um, to address the board and, and for your public comment. So thank you for being here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Deanna and the uh, members of the board. Uh, for the record, my name is Diane Loricella, uh, 21 Little Fox Lane in West Norwalk. Um, I, uh, on occasion, have uh, addressed the board uh, when I have time early in the morning uh, to encourage you all in your work, which is not easy because of the uh, nature of uh, uh, the effect that we have of the pandemic, as well as all the other myriad of, of public health issues. And I uh, do have the utmost respect for the difficulty that you run into. Um, but I have come before this board before to talk about and urge you to continue to find creative ways to tell the public how to reduce the chance of respiratory uh, incidents or infection. Um, finally, after roughly, what is it, four years, I myself, uh, just in the last uh, couple of weeks or two, I'm in my final week of what the CDC suggested, I did uh, become COVID infect infected. And from that, um, I did call the department and spoke with Sherry and just wanted to let you know, I am reflecting upon my experience of um, finding out that I have COVID. I did get Paxlovid, I'm feeling better. Um, however, I do feel that there is still a huge ch chasm on allowing the public reminders in layman's terms, in creative ways, including as I have, I'm on record. Uh, so I suggest you maybe look at my statements over the last four years about ways that you can let the, the public know uh, the uh, postcard or the um, uh, Mr. Weeks had a graphic. I was, I was, I am, or I was going to email that to you later, Deanna, because as you know, I have an outstanding um, request to meet with you to find some positive solutions. And that I would like to see that graphic splashed on the city website, uh, work with the press. That is probably one of the better ways to remind people of all the ways, including ventilation, which has hardly ever been spoken about, and personal hygiene to just reduce infection rates in general, but also respiratory infection. So with that, I'm still looking at at um, reflecting upon my journey, my COVID journey, which I never thought Ms. I would get. Ms. Large, I just want to let you know you have uh, 30 seconds left. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I'll wind up. And I also would like to know how I could gain a copy of the uh, documents that were discussed today. Uh, they all seem very interesting. Uh, the um, the work that Aniela spoke about. Uh, so I very much like to know later how I can just look at a copy of your QI and your um, reports. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Lartella. Um, I don't think we have anybody else from the public here. So I am going to close public comment. Um, is there anything else before we wrap up this morning? All right. We'll hope everyone has a, a great rest of the day and we will adjourn at 8.45 a.m. Have a good Thank day, you. everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh -huh.